All right, well, let's go straight to Scripture this morning. Open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church. Specifically, this book is written to the Hebrews. He says, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. There is a promise. We need to inherit it. But it comes through faith and patience. Everybody say, faith and patience. But to imitate, imitate those who through faith and patience inherited what was promised. Verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. When God made Abraham a promise, he promised that even though Abraham was without seed, he was too old to reproduce. His wife had always been barren, and now she was too old. And God made a promise. And he was so confident about his promise, so absolute about his promise, that after he made a promise, he made an oath. A promise and an oath. A promise and a covenant. I want to read to you for a moment that promise. Since Paul is talking about this promise, let's investigate and look at it. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 16 to 18, God says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Here is Abraham and Sarah. Without having time at the moment to go through the, the journey of Abraham and Sarah. God had made a promise and they waited with patience. And after a while they got tired. And they looked for ways to try to help God so that the promise could come to pass. Sarah, in her frustration, in her discouragement, said, Well, Abraham, maybe God wants you to lay with my handmaiden, and he'll bring us a seed through my handmaiden, by proxy. Listen to me, church. God doesn't want to bless you by proxy. What am I saying? God doesn't want to bless you by blessing somebody else. God wants to bless you. Second best is never, never what God has for us. God always has the first best. And so after a number of mistakes that have lived on to haunt the nation of Israel, after having stepped in the flesh, finally Abraham and Sarah got it right and they pushed on from a place of quasi-faith to really taking hold of faith. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that Sarah judged him who promised to be faithful. She made a judgment call about the character of God. Faith is a judgment call about the character of God. If you believe me and trust me, you're saying something about my character, what you believe about my character. If you doubt me and don't believe me, and that's okay if you doubt me, I'm just a man. But if you doubt me, it's a judgment in your heart about my character. Faith is a judgment call about the character of God. And finally, Abraham and uh, Sarah came to a place where they went from wavering faith to steadfast faith. How many of you want to go from wavering faith to steadfast faith? And it says there that Sarah judged him who promised to be faithful. And therefore, she 
received uh, um, power to conceive seed. That word power says dunamis. Because she made a judgment call about the character of God and didn't waver from it anymore. She received the miraculous supernatural presence of God upon her and it enabled her to conceive seed. And she gave birth. Here's Abraham about to sacrifice this son that he's been waiting so long for. God said that from Abraham's seed would come a nation powerful. And through that particular seed, one day he would bless all the nations of the world. Abraham's about to sacrifice this son. Again, this is what I call extreme faith. We love extreme sports. Abraham was an athlete of athletes. He wrestled with his mind and his logic and trusted the character of God more than what he could see with his eyes, more than what he could touch with his hands. The Word of God became his reality more than the reality he was walking in. Did you hear me? And so he's about to sacrifice his son. Again, Paul says in Hebrews, Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. Why? Because Abraham believed the promise of God could not fail. And even if God asked him to sacrifice his son, Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. In Genesis 22, as Abraham showed his willingness to totally trust God, God said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. God swore by himself. Hebrews 6, verse 13, it says, When God made this promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. He made a promise And then he made an oath. He made a promise, but then he backed it with an oath. I can make you a promise and then I can swear and say, listen, by this $10,000 here, I promise you, I make an oath that should I break my promise, this $10,000 is yours. God didn't have anything greater than himself to swear by, so he swore by himself. He didn't swear and say, as truly as the earth and the heavens remain, I will fulfill this promise. He didn't say that. Because one day the heavens and the earth will pass away. He swore not by something that's finite, he swore by something that's infinite. He swore by himself. Because he will never pass away. Are you with me, church? Stay with me for a little bit as I unfold this thought today. And I believe it will bring great encouragement and increase of faith to your heart. Moses made reference to this fact. That God swore by himself. He swore on himself. That Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars. They would inherit the land. And here they were. They had just come out of Egypt. Some three million Hebrew once been slaves. Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and he comes down and the people had already given themselves to idolatry. They had sinned. In essence, they already broke a covenant that they had with God. And Moses, well, he was PO'd. He was angry. He was upset. And so was God. 
And in Exodus chapter 32, verse 13, Moses says to God, Remember your servant Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you have sworn by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants this land that I promised them, and it will be their inheritance. Moses is standing between the people and God's wrath, and he's saying, God, don't forget, you swore by who you are. You made that oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, there's a promise, and then God went on and made an oath based on himself. God could have said, I swear by the heavens and the earth. But like I said, the heavens and the earth could pass. He didn't swear by something finite. He swore by something infinite that will never pass away. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6 since this is our main text. He said, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. So after waiting patiently... Paul starts this text, Mike, by saying, we want you to imitate those who inherited the promise by faith and patience. Faith and patience is a very important thing. You see, God makes a promise. This topic this morning is about the truthfulness of God. A relationship with somebody is only as trustworthy as the truthfulness of their word and their character. God has a relationship with mankind, wants to have a relationship with the whole world. But that relationship can only go as deep as what we believe him and his word to be. Is he trustworthy? Is he truthful? Can we hang on his word till the last minute? God makes a promise, but with that promise, he then makes a covenant. He makes an oath. It says here that Abraham waited patiently. Let me tell you and answer the question, why is it so often when we're believing God for something he promised, why is it we have to wait? How many of you wish we could do away with the waiting? Why wait? Anyone can touch faith. Say, touch faith. Anyone can touch faith in a moment of euphoria. That's not having faith. What we touch isn't the same as what we have taken hold of and possess. And I have found that in the euphoria of a sermon being preached, we can touch faith. But it's whether or not that faith remains with us four days later during the week. When that faith remains with me four days later during the week, I have that faith. And that faith has me. It's the difference between wavering faith and unfaltering faith. Why do, we have to faith? Why do we have to wait? Anyone can touch faith in a moment of euphoria. That's not having faith. But when you keep believing the promise of God to be true, even in the absence of your circumstances changing, that's when you have faith. I pray and believe. I pray and believe, and to my eyesight, nothing changes. To my hearing, nothing changes. Everything around me remains constant. And while the circumstances of life or the illusion of life remains constant, I am the one who determines what reality will be. If I believe what I see, that will be my ultimate reality. 
But if I believe the word of God more than what I see, that becomes my reality. We all understand the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We understand that. We understand that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen and watch. When we are standing on a promise of God's Word, it might be a promise for healing. It might be a promise for a breakthrough in finances to take care of the situation that you're in, a miracle, something out of left field, unexpected. When we stand on the promise of God's Word and we refuse to believe the reality that is speaking to us, when we refuse to believe the reality of our eyes, the reality of what we hear, if it's a sickness in your own body and you physically feel the symptoms and see the symptoms, when we refuse to believe those present realities and we believe the Word of God as absolute, when we hold on in faith to God's Word and God's character, the realities around us must bow their knee to the reality of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And when we're persistent in faith, our circumstances will bow its knee and confess Jesus Christ is Lord and our circumstances will change and come into alignment with the reality of the Word of God. Come on, give the Lord a a praise offering. Why do we have to have faith? Faith. Why do we have to have patience? Sorry, that was the question. Why do we have to have patience? Patience proves you have faith. Thank you for agreeing. Look at this with me from yet another book in the Word of God. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 21, it says, As it is written, this is God speaking to Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. Now Paul says about Abraham, He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. God calls things that are not. You know what that tells me? God is in the business of changing realities. Do you know what a miracle is? It's the change of a reality. God calls things that are not. Why? Because he ordained words to be the vehicle of spirit, and your words will either be the vehicle of the Holy Spirit and create life, or your words will be a vehicle to demonic spirit, and they will create death. So God speaks, and he calls things that are not. What are the things in your life that are not according to the Word of God? You know what God does when you need a miracle? He calls those things that are not as though they already are. Abraham's name was Abram. God said, I'm changing your name to Abraham. Abraham meaning you are now the father of many nations. Here was Abram and he was without child. He was too old to give life. Here was Sarah, she was barren. Her name was Sarah. But Sarai, and he called her Sarah, meaning mother of many nations. And so before they ever conceived a seed between them, while it was utterly, physically, biologically impossible, God was already calling them 
the father and the mother of many nations. What does God do? He changes reality. How does he change realities? By speaking a different reality. He calls things that are not as though they are. Here's the same principle in reverse. He calls things that are as though they are not. I had Crohn's for a very long time. My doctor told me that it would surely take my life. I had a very acute, severe case of Crohn's. I've been healed of a number of incurable diseases. I am not a walking coincidence. I am a walking testimony that God does not lie. Amen. 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 My doctor assured me that it would eventually take me out, that I had such an acute case of it, that they would start cutting out my intestines because they rot away, and ultimately, I would have to have a... Um, thank you. I haven't lost one centimeter of my intestines, and my appetite has never diminished. <laughs> and I bear testimony of it today. <laughs> God calls things that are not as though they are, and he calls things that are as though they are not. And I spoke to my crones, and I said, you don't belong to me, and you have no right to me. I am not labeled by crones. I am labeled by the healing power of God. Amen. You see, sometimes innocently, and I don't want you to get hung up on this, but it's the truth. Innocently, we say, oh, my migraines are horrible. I say it sometimes. And I stop myself and say, no, it's not my migraines. I'm not taking ownership of it. It doesn't own me. It doesn't own me. My healing. My healing. Why can't we say my healing as often as we say, oh, my back problem? God's word is truth. And so we see here in Romans 4, 17, as it is written, God says, I have made you a father of many nations. Abraham is our father in the sight of God. He believed in God, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. It goes on, verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And because of this believing, against all hope, because of this unwavering faith, because the reality of what he saw, don't you think? If Sarah was 90 and Abraham was older, and God said, young man, you're going to have a son. And you're going to follow the nations. How many of you think that Abraham every night would have put action together with his faith? Come on now, don't get religious on me. I could imagine Abraham saying, come on, babe, we got a date. To the tent we go. Come on. It says that, in verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. He looked at the reality of this world. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. He looked at the reality, the biological reality. She's been barren her whole life, and now she's old, uh, 90 years old as well. Yet he did not waver through the reality of the world that was speaking to him. Yet he did not waver through the reality 
of the deadness of her womb. Yet he did not waver through unbelief in regards to God's promise. But in fact, he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And every time he went to bed with his wife and had fun in the process, he said, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Your promise is true, and I can rest my life on your promise. He looked at the realities. You see, God is a reality changer. That's what a miracle is. A miracle is when reality, according to the laws of this world, are speaking loud and clear. But we keep refusing to believe the realities of this present darkness. And we believe the realities of the light of the kingdom of God. And when we believe the word of God more than the word of man, when we believe the word of God more than the testimony of our own physical body, when we believe the word of God more than what we are experiencing, all these things bow their knee to Jesus Christ and the word of God becomes Lord over all. Hallelujah. Abraham believed God. I want to say to you today, God is believable. I don't just mean believe in the existence of a God. I'm telling you, God is believable. God is believable. It says, he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Even while his reality was not changing, He gave glory to God. His faith was speaking louder than his fears. He had quieted his fears. And all Abraham could hear was his faith. He was fully persuaded that God had power to do what God had promised. Hebrews 6.16, we're going to come back to the original text. Men swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath, they swear. They make a promise and then they swear. They make an oath. Here's a promise. Then we swear to that promise. We make an oath. We make a covenant. Two things, a promise and a covenant. A promise and an oath. Something we swear by. Men swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. It's like I said earlier, if I were to swear to you, I promise you I'm going to do this. Here's $10,000 in a a bank account held in trust. If I don't fulfill my part of the bargain, that $10,000 is yours. There's the oath. There's the covenant. And it says that men swear by someone or something greater than themselves to put an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. God had a purpose. He had a plan. He had a promise for Abraham and his descendants. And because he wanted to make it so clear, clear, he confirmed it with an oath. God had a purpose, a will for Abraham's descendants. How many of you know you are Abraham's descendants by faith in the seed, Jesus Christ, who came through that lineage? God had a purpose and a will for Abraham's descendants. So he voiced it as a promise and swore and made an oath. It goes on to say in Hebrews verse 18, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Stop. He did this so that by two unchangeable things. The King James says by two immutable things. There are the immutable qualities of God, things that can never change. 
And God says, or the Bible says, God did this so that by two unchangeable things, two immutable things, what are they? The promise of God can never be changed. And when God makes an oath, it can never be broken. A promise and a covenant. A promise and an oath. Men swear by something greater than themselves to give strength to their promise. God has nothing greater than himself, so he swore by himself. His oath became himself. God made a promise, and he said, I'll put my life on it. Are you understanding the language here? Are you understanding the language, the imagery? God made a promise, and he said, I swear by my life. I seal this promise with an oath. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are always yes in Jesus Christ. No matter how many promises God made, they are always yes in Jesus Christ. Watch this. Stay with me. They are always yes in Christ. God makes a promise they are yes in Christ. Up until now, we've been looking at a promise and an oath. God swore he made an oath by himself. He put his life on it. Though God makes many promises, the yes are always in Christ. Pause. I'm going to take you to another verse Hebrews 12, verse 24, Paul says, To Jesus Christ, the mediator of a new covenant. The mediator of a new oath. To Jesus Christ, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Blood speaks. The blood of Jesus speaks, and the Bible says the blood of Abel speaks. And the blood cries up from the land, and God hears the millions of people whose blood was spilled into the ground. Abel's blood, he was murdered. He was innocent. Injustice took his life. And the Bible says that the blood of Abel cries out. It speaks. It cries out to God. A travesty. Injustice. It's not right. But the blood of Jesus speaks. When those Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross, when demons were laughing and dancing and they thought they put an end to the promise of God, all they were doing was fulfilling the fact that God swore by himself and as they put him to death, the very life of God was giving life to the promise. And every drop of blood still echoes to the heavens today. And when the promises of God are red, the blood of Jesus says, yes! God said, I'll swear by myself. I'm putting my life on this promise. And he did. He himself came to the cross. You know why Jesus Christ couldn't stay in the grave? If Jesus stayed in the grave, it would have annulled the promise because he is God in the flesh and it would have been the end of God and the promise would have been dissolved. But because God's promise cannot be broken, heaven called him up from the grave. And the mere fact 
that Jesus Christ was crucified and he rose again. The oath of God was coming to pass. Every promise in this new covenant is ours by virtue of the fact that God's promises cannot lie and his oath cannot be broken. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. I attribute the fact that I've seen many miracles in my personal lives and in the life of this church, we have seen an incredible amount of miracles. And I attribute it to this one fact. I have convinced myself that God's word is more true and more real than anything I'm going through. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come as we get ready to receive communion. As the emblems are being passed out, if our singers and whatever musicians we have, if they would come to the platform as well. Pastor Sam, if Sandra and Flavius, if you would come with your baby, and as the emblems are coming, church, I encourage you to take hold of the cup and the bread because the cup and the bread are the covenant, the oath that God swore. He swore by himself. In a moment as we take communion, it's going to have great significance and meaning. We have Flavius here and Sandra, and we're going to dedicate their baby girl. They want to dedicate their child to the Lord. That's a good thing, isn't it, church? I have a certificate here. Let me just take hold of the certificate. Adorabella Maria. Adorabella. We're going to dedicate this baby. Amen. Ushers, you start to pass the emblems. Father, we thank you for dad and for mom. We thank you for this child. Coincidentally, today we talk about a promise of, that you gave Abraham and Sarah and their child. We thank you for a father and a mother and their baby girl. They've named her Adorabella because they believe her to be adorable and beautiful. And Father, we dedicate this little girl on behalf of Daddy and Mommy. It's okay, sweetie. That's okay. If someone looked like me and they were putting hands on me, I'd cry too. Father, we just thank you for this young baby, this little girl, on behalf of mom and dad's desires. We dedicate this child to you. We ask you to take her in your hands. See this gift that the parents are offering back to you and bless her. We pray your protection over her. We pray that you will keep her safe that your anointing will literally clothe her and surround her. We thank you for her life, and we ask you, Father, that by your Spirit you will lead her. When she comes to the time of making her own choices, you will lead her in the path that leads to Jesus Christ, and that she will live and sing and walk for you. We bless this family, we bless these parents, and we bless this child in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you. Here's a little certificate. Well, you did pretty good, young lady. Uh, It's all right. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. (sighs) Marilyn, would you come here, please? You can bring your communion emblems. Last Sunday, in the middle of my preaching, I had a red notice flashing on the back screen. And that notice was that Marilyn was taken to the hospital. She had had a mini stroke. You all very obediently stood with me and in the middle of my preaching prayed with me. Wednesday night, I received word. I don't know if you ever got my phone call. I, I did. Eventually. You did? Yeah. Good. Okay. That's yeah. just to let you know, I did call. I tried yeah. to connect. Yeah. But you know what's better than that? 
I'd rather a believing pastor who prays and leads his church to pray. And uh, we surely been praying for you. Now, I was told that when you were in the hospital, they said you had two blockages in your brain yep. and one in your neck. Yep. And uh, were they about to do a procedure at some point? Yeah. Well, they did. They did an angio, I don't know what it's called. Angioplast. Yeah, and then they, they saw the blockage. They told me they knew where the strokes were coming from. Um, but they weren't sure if it was in a spot that they could put a stent in. And that was in the brain? In the brain. In, in the brain. The so they found them with MRIs? CAT scans. CAT scans. Mm -hmm. They are going to do angioplast, put stints in. Mm -hmm. And before they got to do the procedure, the two blockages in your brain disappeared. Mm -hmm. So they misplaced them. Yeah. <laughs> they can't find them. They laid them down somewhere, or you shook your head, and they just rattled away. Listen to me. It is no coincidence that you hear testimony after testimony after testimony like this in this church. And why? Because we dare to believe God more than what we see and more than what we hear. Sarah judged him who promised to be faithful. And because she made a character judgment about the character of God, and she made it right, she received supernatural power to conceive seed. You no doubt knew the church was praying. Mm -hmm. Somebody in your family or yourself sent a message for us to pray. That means you have faith in God and faith that when the church prays, God will hear. You made a judgment call about God's character. And he gave you supernatural power to conceive a miracle. Yes. Amen. Two blockages in her brain, uh, CAT scans, and they're about to do procedures. And then just before they do the procedures, they're gone. They're gone. And they're going to stay gone. Amen. There is one blockage in her neck. It is 60%. And we're going to believe God for even that to disappear. Amen. Would you stand with me? As you hold the cup in your hand, understand this. God has made a promise. He cannot lie. So the promises of God are unalterable. But he didn't just make a promise. He then backed it up with a covenant, with an oath. He swore on his own life. He went to the cross to fulfill those promises. He had to rise from the dead or God's word would fail. Isn't it so interesting that Jesus Christ is called all through Scripture the Word of God. The Word of God could not fail. The Word of God could not fail. The Word of God will not fail. We fail in our believing. We fail in our trusting. But when we go from wavering faith to unwaverable faith, the Word of God that was resurrected from the grave, the very Word that was in the presence of hell itself, exchanged those realities for the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord. Faith is believing in God's character. More than you believe, the character of the witness of your own eyes, the witness of your own feelings, the witness of your own ears. I choose to believe. While I trust very little, I trust God implicitly. God is faithful. You hold in your hands symbols, they're symbols. But they are reminders of a reality. And that reality is that God made a promise and he confirmed it with his life. The bread and the wine. The body and the blood. Every promise God has made. The Bible says 
is yes in Christ. Though the promises of God are many, they are yes in Christ. The blood of Jesus still cries out. Every time you stand on a promise, every time you start to believe and say, God, your word says, your word says, your word says, the blood of Jesus makes harmony in heaven and says, yes, yes, come on, keep saying it, keep believing it. My blood says, yes, that's why I died. Yes, 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 let's change the reality of this hellish earth and let the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. As you take communion today, I want you. The Bible says, the blood of Jesus says yes, and the amen is spoken by us, the church and amen, put in today's language, means that's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. When you stand on the Word of God, God already made the promise. The Son of God is saying yes with His blood. He needs our mouth to be a vehicle of the Holy Ghost. And when we say that's how it's going to be, three come into agreement, four even God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost who brings the power of God to make it happen. And you and me, his sons and daughters. We come into agreement. I want you to take these emblems today. And whatever your need is, whatever miracle you need, faith is proven by patience. And I want you to be constant in your patience and believe the character of God to fulfill that miracle. I want you to take hold of your, what you're believing for and saying, God, I don't care what I see. I believe your word. I believe your word. It's going to happen. It's already happened. By faith, I am already healed. By faith, I'm already delivered. And the reality of this world will soon change and become the reality that lines up with God's word. Can I get an agreement? Amen. Would you take the bread and eat it and then drink straight after? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to lay hands on Marilyn. I want you to lay hands on yourself or on the person next to you. Let's come into agreement. Men, take hold of your wife's hand and come into agreement for your family. Come into agreement for one another. Put your hand on the shoulder of someone near you. Come into agreement with them. Father, we thank you. We speak to every reality of this world that contradicts your promises. We believe you. You're not a God of the ordinary. You're the God of the extraordinary. You're not a God of the natural. You're the God of the supernatural. And so anything you do is always supernatural. It is above the natural. I thank you that you are a reality changer. You cannot lie. Your promises are yes and amen. We speak to our circumstances we speak and we say, God, your will is being done in my life just like it's being done in heaven. Things are changing. Devil, get out of the way. Things are changing. Devil, get out of the way. You're not my boss. You're not my Lord. You don't control me. I'm not your puppet. I belong to Jesus Christ, and he set me free. Hallelujah. Father, we agree for Marilyn. The same way those two blockages that CAT scans verified. Stints ready to go in, a procedure prepared. I thank you, God, the same way they disappeared. We agree for this blockage in her neck to totally disappear as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the finger of God clear a passageway and let that blood flow uninterrupted. We give you glory, God. We thank you. I fear not what men say. I trust your word. We trust your word. And for each and every person in this place, in the name of Jesus Christ, we say yes and amen.
That's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. Come on, say it. That's how it's going to be. Listen, the next time a negative word comes to you, the next time doubt comes to you, the next time, and it might be right now while I'm still talking, I want you to say, devil, speak to the hand. And that hand is the hand of my dad. The hand of God. Kingdom of God is near you. The hand of God is near you. You tell the enemy, you speak to the hand. That's the hand of God. And his hand is for me, not against me. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Give the Lord a shout. Give him a clap. Give him a praise offering. Father, we thank you. I thank you even now for a miracle in all of these lives. With faith and patience, we change our reality through Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. 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 That's how it's going to be. We're going to say grace over the food. And we're going to let you go and uh, have uh, fellowship time. And just before I let you go, just one last moment. Because this is truly the most important thing. And that's where you stand with God. Maybe your faith has been weak and you've slid and you walked away, turned away. Maybe you just shut the door hard and fast and said never again. I remember a time in my life I was in the ministry and I was so broken. I told God, don't ever come knocking on my door again. (laughs) I'm glad he doesn't listen to me all the time. Maybe you've walked away. Maybe you've never let Jesus Christ in your heart. While every eye is closed, if it's time to let Jesus in your heart, if you've not done it and the Spirit of God is touching you, would you quickly, while eyes are closed, raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. I want to get right with God. I want to ask Jesus in my heart. Every eye closed, raise your hand right now. If you're sensing the Spirit of God on you and that's you, say yes. Just put your hand up. Say, I want that. I need that. I need that. I want that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sir, you're looking at me so intently. Thank you. I've caught your attention. I see your respect. Obviously, I've caught your attention. I don't know you. I know nothing about you. Do you know Christ? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Yes? Thank you. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're here today, sir. So glad you're here. I pray that God bless you. Father, you see the hunger in his heart. Touch him. Touch him. In the name of Jesus, touch him. Minister to him. And answer that well-kept secret, that desire of his heart, that prayer, that longing, answer it. Father, for your name's sake, because you cannot deny yourself, bless him in Jesus' name. Amen.